This is a person who excelled at everything that she's done in her life. She's been an advocate. She is an advocate of the Supreme Court. She's promised me that if ever you get into trouble, Rishab, we'll fight your cases for free. <laughs> so I'm going to hold her to that at some point. Uh, but she's also been, and this is what uh, you must take note of, she's been Minister of State for Culture and then also External Affairs. She's been a two-time parliamentarian and most importantly is the reason why uh, today India is known across the world. Uh, the team at the Ministry of External Affairs does all of that, but there are a few people who head it and we're very lucky that the person who headed it uh, is joining us here today. She is uh, undoubtedly a very strong voice for the BJP, but also a very strong voice for the country. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, our first guest today, Union, former Union Minister Minakshi Lekhe. <laughs> So, uh, how does it feel at the very outset to be back to school? <laughs> Lovely. Very, very happy memories of school. And uh, two-way traffic, one, as a student myself, and two, I've got grown-up children who have participated in MUN. Oh, really? Yes. Fantastic. And many, many years ago, wow. but they have been part of this journey. So, both as a parent, as a child myself. So. It's a, it's a lovely journey. Oh, well, excellent. So, sh I hope you have all good things to say about MUN. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. But, but let me start by asking you this question then. Uh, you started your career as a science student. Yeah. Now, many of us who are sitting in the audience, and even me, are sometimes confused that what do you do eventually in life because there are plethora of options. So, from science, you dabbled in law and then eventually joined politics. How does one actually find their calling when you're in school? So there is nothing called calling. My life itself is an experiment and an example. Uh, you can change your objectives in the journey. And it's not about reaching place A or place B. It's about the journey. A uh, few uh, values and qualities, for example, uh, critical thinking, communication skills, language skills, mathematical skills. These are skills which one must possess. These are basic skills. And these skills can be used no matter what you do. And uh, what you think today will change. Uh, many a times our opinions are shaped by our parents. Many a times uh, competitive things around that so and so has made it to this place, so so and so should make it to that place or good students only do science, or uh, uh, women, uh, girl child studies, subject A, subject B. In, in my time, girls didn't study law, for example. So there are all kinds of uh, things which impact you. And those impacts made you make you who you are, and that can change. So I always say, um, just read and do things wherever your interest lies. So the good thing about my uh, own life was that I was not stopped from reading books. I read whatever I wanted to read. In spite of being a science student, I read a lot of books which were not on science subject. I mean, I did score marks and I did have to pass my exams. But in addition to that, libraries, because we did not have internet and everything was not available through Google Baba. So we had to sit in the consultation section and a person like me would even read about Van Gogh. I would read about world history, I'd read about Indian history, I'd read about some books which I later realized were books on anthropology, marriage and kinship, systems in India, not all positive, but I've, I've, I've done it all. So, so it makes me very comfortable as a person just uh, sort of trying to understand new things, new people. So the message is be a voracious reader. A just voracious reader keep and reading. Open, open to accepting ideas from everyone. Right. And uh, so it's important uh, that we just don't chat GPT and Google, but we also read. That is what the, the message is. And uh, you know, you mentioned something about women and you've been such a strong voice for women, uh, both in parliament and outside. You said earlier equal opportunities were something that were not, you know, very easily available. 
and you've championed the Women's Reservation Bill in Parliament. You, in fact, chaired the committee. Uh, but there's a school of thought that reservation may not be the best way forward, whether it be in school or whether it be in Parliament. So what is your thought on reservation for caste, creed, community and gender? Do you think that is the best way forward? No, I would say, uh, you know, before coming to the great answer, I would say, let's go, let's delve deep into the history deep into the society. So when we delve deep into the society and delve deep into the history, we realize though all people are born equal, not all people get equal opportunity. And uh, we must be open to accepting the fact that equal opportunity is what represents an inclusive and fair society. If at the very base or the bottom of the society there is lack of inclusion and there is lack of uh, equal opportunity or uh, uh, biases, how does a person who is born equal achieve what you or others have achieved? So opportunity becomes very, very important and there is something called affirmative action in Indian constitution. And uh, because of that, resumption is not the panacea uh, for all ills in the society, but uh, it's a temporary solution. And that temporary solution should be offered till we achieve certain level of equal mobility in the society. And uh, we all must accept this with, again, open mind, open arms, open thoughts. Uh, there, are, there have been historical wrongs. Uh, the structure of society is not fair and uh, in that while we are dealing with those subjects this is one way of going forward to take everyone along because taking everyone along uh, everywhere is very very important. One example I want to give and that example is comparing our society with Pakistan. Seriously, I'm not joking. See the two sides were one country at one time. Just in about 75 years, how our society has changed and how that society has degraded. And when I have interacted with some of the Pakistani uh, politicians at one-on-one uh, -on -one level, I don't want to tell you the bad words they use in open communication because I was all, I mean, I also come from that part of India, which is now Pakistan. My family comes from that part of India. And we are all Punjabis. How the Punjabi domination in Pakistan had in that society and how, Paki, how Punjabis in India have added to the you know, economy, business, so on and so forth. Just in 75 years and how they deal with the caste subject, the kind of language they use, the kind of language society possesses, is that if India did not have affirmative action, what India would have been 75 years ago. So we must understand, but and again, going back, going back to the issue of Car, uh, of reservation being the panacea, answer is no, definitely not. But this is a temporary solution till we achieve certain inclusion, and then we must we must work at implementing it better. You know, there are always ways of making it better, giving more opportunity to the ones who are deprived and bring them at the same level. And it's about opportunity. After giving an opportunity, it's not about getting, you know, beyond. Beyond, you have to get on your own strength. I think you summarized beautifully uh, the difference between two nations uh, that at the midnight hour were uh, divided. And uh, then it's a privilege and a pleasure to be able to be called a Bhartiya. Um, and I think that's something that all of us uh, would agree that we are very lucky to be born in this great nation that is India. Uh, aren't we? Yes. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, I must bring up a highly, uh, 
you know, uh, I had the good fortune of studying in some of the schools in South Bombay, or as they call it, and we learned more about the world and less about India. Uh, we felt, and I tell you, ma'am, that we felt very proud about the fact that uh, things that were happening overseas, but when we went to, it was difficult to identify as an Indian because an Indian was somebody who was always thought to be Ashatum engineer ho. Yeah, fair, you know, you come from the land which is, uh, which is full of snake charmers. This was when I was growing up. That's changed radically in the last. And not it to, to the government for doing that. And that I, one of the things that I, uh, I particularly admire is what ma'am you all have done with the G20. How you made G20 so accessible to everybody. Uh, usually foreign policy is done from Delhi and everything happens in Delhi and people in Bombay and different parts of the country just look. But G20, because one of the students who led the Y20 was earlier volunteer at IM1. And as I was asking Philip, saying, and he said, uh, you know, we're doing these events all across the country to increase foreign policy events. Uh, that was really commendable. But what can, and that's very good, ma'am, at a civil society level. But suppose somebody who's sitting out here who's interested in foreign policy or international relations, how can they contribute to the MEA and the story of India? So MUN is one of them. <laughs> I must say because that gives all of you a global exposure and make you part of the global events and how global strategy and policies are operating. So one develops that global outlook. But you all must have your roots and feet fixed in India or Bharat because Bharat is what is going to give you the platform to express yourself, your identity and take you to the world. And as Rishabh just mentioned, that the perception about India is not a land of snake charmers, not a land of people who uh, are deprived and always seeking uh, the crumbs. No. This is a country of knowledge givers. This is a country of people who are very hard working, very honest, upright, able to integrate in other societies without causing disturbance in those societies and yet remain their own self. So I always call it Indians behave like a bowl of salad. So all ingredients you can see, the pepper, the lettuce, the cucumber, vinegar you add, you, you do all kinds of things, but every ingredient is visible to the eye. Yet, together it tastes good. That's what Indians add to the bowl of salad. But the, the fact that he asked that how can, how can young people contribute. So Y20 was one such event. In addition to Y20, uh, Prime Minister launched something called Mission Life. And Mission Life is about sustainable living. I think we all can incorporate. All the electronic goods, all the toys, all the clothes, all the consumer goods that we buy on a daily basis. The responsible living is also about responsible consumption. And responsible consumption also means not becoming consumerist all the time. And, and so mission life we all can incorporate in our, in our respective lives. We can all write slogan writing for example, participating in quizzes. Um, and since MUN is also an extension of UN programming, I would just suggest, Rishab can just, or others in the organizing team can think about it. How about having schools to do G20? about schools to do G7. So various strategy groups meet that happen. So maybe we can, we can create a security council. We can, oh, we can create, uh, uh, you know, various sections because UN is not uh, UN General Assembly only. UNGA is just one part of it. The exposure can then be on the economic side, on uh, uh, climate change, on uh, 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 collaboration, on managing the conflicts. So there can be various aspects. So that will give an insight into how the real task is done and that exposure will help 
in developing strategic thinking, no matter what you do. I don't know. Many of you will become doctors, engineers, uh, leaders, but this exposure will stay with you. That, like the, I said, that language skills. So critical thinking is very important, and strategic thinking is part of critical thinking. So maybe these are the things I would suggest. No, absolutely, and we take it um, into your, your suggestions are very valid, and ma'am, you'll be very happy to know that you know from a model UN, we've transformed it into a movement to unite nations with the idea that you talk about different subjects, and it's just not a mirror of the UN, uh, but is a little more than that. But ma'am, uh, just I will prod once one last time because I'm keen to uh, you know to ask on behalf of them that suppose a student uh, wishes to take an internship with. Uh, in the ministry, are there avenues and possibilities for a student who is in grade 10, 11, or 12, or uh, you know, in high school and beyond, uh, to engage with uh, the external affairs ministry in some way? See, uh, I would say that if an event is happening, right. uh, a G20 event is happening, uh, and that event has at least G20, we did something like 252 areas and 260 events. And each event had four components. So one component was the real conversations which happened. Then uh, uh, cultural event was that, culinary event was there, and tourism of the place, you know, local, local uh, touristic spots. So every event had four elements in it. Uh, for very young students, I can say documentation could be one and uh, volunteering could be the other. Um, internship with MEA, you need little senior uh, students, you know, college graduates and above. Reason is very different because uh, uh, the, but, but with the fun part, I can think that, you know, tourism, uh, volunteering at the conference, handling uh, a few papers or collecting cards and things. There can be some sort of engagement, involvement, but quiz, etc. you all can participate. A slogan writing, everybody is open, but, but the real conversations, that's, uh, I mean, it's hard for me to say no, but, uh, but there are opportunities when you grow up a little, and all that learning you've done will always stay with you in the process. Of course, and uh, no, I'm just. I was curious on behalf of the very over enthusiastic 16 year old Rishabh who was in the audience saying, How can I engage? Uh, per se. But ma'am, you've given many, many an avenue, and I appreciate that. And sometimes in school, we face this that even in school projects, it's difficult to get along with people. Um, I'm sure you've done school projects where uh, you've been paired with people that you don't like, and then you're hoping, saying that, uh, I wish I was only paired with my friend. But navigating international relations and the current geopolitical scenario is a bit like that. As minister, sometimes you would have had to work with people that were not necessarily the best of friends to India. How did you solve that Kremlin? How did you, you know, navigate that? And how can we utilize that when we're dealing with somebody in school that we just don't like? Okay, so uh, working anywhere in life is almost like school project. You're always paired with people who don't like you or you don't like them. And that's life. You can ask your parents, you can ask any grown-up around you. But you, I think the best way is to learn from your moms. Mostly mothers are the ones who are trying to strike a balance with in-laws, her own parents, work, school, teachers, etc., etc. And, and that striking a balance becomes so important that I constantly go back to my middle school mathematics class. So the mathematics class, you know, we all done sets. Everyone's done sets, right? So you remember those circles? Yeah? So there, there's a set and within that there is a set. And there is a set which is outside that set. And there is a set which is intersecting. So this intersectionality is what is most important. So you can't stay outside. The best could be your 
within the set, that's the best. And that's the easiest. When you're right there, right inside, there's a complete coherence. But life is not like that. Life is to find intersectionality, to find collaboration or common points. So even when you're on the opposite side, mostly, there will always be some common things which you can find. And that's what negotiation is all about. So go back to your middle school, go back to the class of mathematics. Remember, life is about sets. And it's about finding intersectionality. It's about common agenda. Sometimes you'll have 50% common agenda. Sometimes you'll have one third common agenda. Sometimes you'll just have 2%. Sometimes just about 1%. Sometimes you're simply touching and you're not really intersectional. So finding that common agenda, finding that common good, common goal is what most negotiations are all about. And you'll remember me in life whenever you'll come across difficult people, difficult situations, difficult things, you always find common agenda, common good and common way of working. And that working methodology will take you a long, long way in life also. Everywhere. <laughs> Wonderfully uh, articulated on a jovial note on behalf of the students who don't understand maths. <laughs> it says like, everyone has done in big, and that's why I gave the example of not integration differentiation. Yes, sure, sure. I gave the example of sets because sets all of us have done. Integration differentiation may not have done. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I really appreciate how you uh, explained that uh, example, and I think that uh, will help us whilst we navigate problems in life uh, and difficult people. Let me take you to an area of interest which once I started I and got exposed to India more and less just to Anglicized school of thought which is the idea of India. The idea of India before I started I and was uh, what I understood from Western media. Uh, the idea of India as I discovered over a period of time can also be found in both mythology and history in India. I was not, like many of you, very ardent. I don't know how many of you are ardent readers of history. How many of you really like history? And how many of you don't like history? I, so, but as I, as I read more, I kind of realized that, you know, and then we had Amish Tripathi, we had Ashwin Sangin, we had so many of these. And its history and mythology has suddenly become so very easy to understand. There's a deep correlation between mythology, history and India. Therefore, if you were to explain India, utilizing one example from mythology or history, what would that example be? So, uh, don't take it politically, uh, because that's the first mistake we can make, and that is uh, we identify people with our own bias but understand it technically, historically. And uh, one person I would, you know, say you must read is uh, Ram, no matter which religion you come from. Understanding Ram as a person, and I have been your age, and I have questioned, and I have had arguments with my mom, um, and it took me a long, long time to understand him. Uh, and I, it would have taken me, you know, what, more than 25, 30 years to understand what Ram is all about. Uh, from a political perspective, because when we are discussing MUN, we are discussing politics, we are discussing international politics. So understanding Ram from, say, that perspective, Understanding Ram from a perspective of uh, moral correctness, what is morally correct behavior. And from moral correctness perspective, simply because mom has said something, even if she's a stepmother, how she goes, how he goes to uh, the forest and he's banished, lives a very difficult life in spite of being a good prince. 
in spite of being an obedient student, in spite of being better than the best in his peer group, he chooses to be banished. And after banishment, the difficult life he lives, his wife is taken away. And when his wife is taken away, he does not leave his morally correct behavior. Very hard to do, especially in difficult circumstances, to remain morally correct and in spite of difficulties, to remain upright, to remain uh, very convinced about one's own correct attitude and behavior, especially in difficult circumstances, and not dithering from his path of morally correct behavior, and making allies, making allies with who? The like-minded, the good, and the correct. So whether people, or even in Ramayana, the description is of Monkey King, Sugreev, the forest dwellers, so on and so forth. He keeps doing the right thing. The Kavert, Ahilya, uh, uh, Shabari, uh, uh, the, the Vanar Sena, all that is forming allies with people who were not really the well-placed people, but morally correct people. And he keeps making those allies fights the battle with Ravan, wins Sita back, and then does what? Establishing Ram Rajya. And Ram Rajya is where king or the ruler's place is above the social people and has to be better than them. So when you are intellectually better because you have to rule over a few million in a country like India, uh, your morally correct behavior is what will make a society more inclusive. So his whole life is about inclusion, uh, marginalized people who he brought them to mainstream, uh, morally correct behavior in spite of personal difficulties. So understanding the banishment of Sita was very difficult for me as a girl child, as a woman. But it took me years to understand that how in politics, it's not about your personal commitment. It's about your perception in public life. And for keeping his perception of being above board and uh, keeping the political aspect still above board and personal aspects separately was such a difficult thing to, to negotiate, to understand. And that's what I understood, that he kept himself committed to Sita all his life. He was a king's son whose father had three wives. He himself was a Chakravarti Raja, but continued to live with Sita's memory and even did Yagya with Sita's statue, a small one, and kept his personal commitment to himself and kept the public perception to other, other people till the public itself corrects their own behavior. So public understood what the wrong behavior was, who loved Kushwar, and what Sita is all about. So I think living by example, reading by example, is another way of living life of morally correct and appropriate behavior. And I think when we discuss politics, when we discuss social propriety, when we discuss Ram Rajya, when we talk about inclusion, I think there are so many lessons in Ramayana, which is a simplified version of Itihas of our history. And that Itihas is something we all need to understand because Itihas also gave in Bhartiyas the ability, capability to improvise upon, adding stories, writing in different languages, uh, perception, the, the writer's uh, own uh, imagination, creativity. So I think this is a very creative method of bringing history of India to the forefront. Well, so many lessons from uh, Ramayana, Mahabharat, and you know, from Indian scriptures also, which, uh, and like you rightly said, it's irrespective of religion, which help you become conscientious leaders, which is essentially what we're trying to do. Uh, let me ask you the last question, because I want to leave at least one question from the audience. So I'm going to ask you a small rapid uh, there's no hamper at the end of that. <laughs> hamper what, is what, your affection. 
<laughs> Every <laughs> month, yeah. <laughs> that, that is. That was, the last part was my line, but thank you. <laughs> but what's the first thought that comes when I say the following words? When I say role model, what's the first thought that comes to your mind? Uh, Shri Krishna. When I say United States of America? Uh, strategic ally. When I say China? Uh, neighbor, difficult one. <laughs> Russia? Uh, Friend and partner. North Korea. Commercial. <laughs> uh, uh, commercial uh, friend, a trade trading partner. Commerce pa and trade. Pakistan. <laughs> neighbor, a very very difficult. But I should not say neighbor. I should say that's the place which was erstwhile India. <laughs> and when I say India. 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 Ooh, Bharat, my Jan Bhumi, my Karm Bhumi. When I say, when I say youth in politics. Oh, very welcome. A is incomplete without? Two cups of coffee. <laughs> Holiday, what's the first thought? Oh, too many. Hazaru khwaishe aisi ki har khwaish pe dam nikle. Bahut nikle mere arman, lekin phir bhi kab nikle. And the last one is when I say I am you when, what's the first thought that comes to your mind? I can only think of my boys, my children and all your lovely faces because uh, as a parent, I'm sure all your parents will be so proud of you uh, when you participate, when you generate that animated discussion and that simulation. Uh, I don't know, I keep going back as a parent that that mom and me keeps coming up, <laughs> which is which is hard. These are young men today, they're they grown up men, but uh, I still go back to their school days. <laughs> Ma'am, you know this conversation, um, it yeah. reminded me of what my grandfather used to keep telling me, saying that uh, he said, Rishab, a conversation with a knowledgeable person is better than reading a hundred books. But remember, if you don't read a hundred books, the knowledgeable person will have a conversation more than five minutes. <laughs> so, ma'am's message out here is very clear. Be a voracious reader, uh, study math, uh, love your country, and do your bit for the nation and for a better world. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, on behalf of all of you, I want to thank uh, Ma'am from traveling from all the way from Delhi. Thank you. Thank you so very much.